All right, uh, welcome to lecture five of CS182. Today, we're going to talk about backpropagation and neural networks. So before we can uh, describe how neural networks actually work, we need to talk a little bit about computation graphs. See, uh, as I mentioned before, all these machine learning algorithms that we're learning about, they, they basically are a program with some parameters. And one of the ways that we can visualize that program is by drawing a graph representing the flow of computation. And this turns out to be very useful both for uh, understanding how neural networks work and later on for developing algorithms to automatically compute gradients of neural networks so that we can use those gradient descent algorithms we learned about in the previous lecture. So uh, here's what a computation graph uh, looks like. Uh, let's say that we have two inputs, x1 and x2. So this is a, basically a vector with two dimensions. And let's say we have two parameters, theta1 and theta2. Uh, a computation graph is a directed acyclic graph where nodes correspond to mathematical operations. So here, for example, we have two multiplication nodes. Multiplication takes in two inputs, two numbers, and multiplies them together. So uh, here we would, we would compute x1 times theta1 and x2 times theta2. And then maybe we add the result of that computation together. And perhaps we also have some uh, ground truth label y, and we would subtract our label y from the result of that computation and then square the corresponding quantity. So this computation graph describes a program or a function. Which program or function does it describe? Well, take a moment to think about this. What expression does this compute? Or equivalently, what program does this correspond to? This is a, a particular uh, type of model that we actually saw in a previous lecture. Take a moment to think about what it might be. So this computation graph represents linear regression, right? We compute x1 times theta1 plus x2 times theta2. That's our model. So that's our estimate of the correct uh, regression uh, output. And then we subtract y and square the difference. And this gives us the mean squared error loss. So this is the mean squared error loss with a linear regression model. Generally, when we draw computation graphs for neural networks or other types of models, we're really drawing the graph combined with a loss function. So at the end of the graph, the result should be a scalar value representing the loss. Because that way, when we want to use some optimization algorithm like gradient descent, we would compute gradients through the entire computation graph, and that would give us the gradients we need to optimize our loss. So neural networks are computation graphs, although they're generally much more complex and much larger computation graphs than the one that I have on this slide. Before we can really uh, draw computation graphs for neural networks, we need to uh, talk a little bit about the vectors and matrices. Uh, and after we do that, we can design generic tools for computation graphs and then use those tools to train many different kinds of neural networks with minimal additional engineering. Okay, so let's draw the same uh, linear regression graph as we did before, but in a much simpler way by using vectors. So now, I'm going to have a node x that now represents a vector of two entries, x1 and x2. And I'm going to have a node theta that also represents a vector with two entries, theta1 and theta2. And now I also have a multiplication node, only multiplication this time means dot product. So that means that I'm going to do x transpose theta. So multiplying two vectors is basically the inner product or the dot product of those two uh, vectors. And then I subtract my label y, and I square the difference. So this is exactly the same computation graph that I showed before, only now it's written in a much more concise way uh, by using vector notation. And in later slides, I'll actually drop the little uh, vector decorator on top of the symbols. You should just assume that, unless stated otherwise, x's and thetas and so on will all be uh, vectors. Okay. So this is the computation graph for linear regression. What about logistic regression? If you remember from lecture two, logistic regression is an algorithm for classification. Logistic regression uh, predicts a discrete label, and the loss function that we talked about uh, when we discussed logistic regression was negative log likelihood. So let's draw the computation graph for logistic regression uh, with the negative log likelihood loss. 
So the distribution over labels for logistic regression is given by the softmax, and the softmax is applied to a linear model. And then if you take the logarithm of this and negate it to get the negative log likelihood loss, uh, this equation might look complex, complex, but I just obtained it by taking the log of the probability up above and then negating it. Um, so the negative log likelihood loss for logistic regression is negative x transpose theta y, where theta y is the parameter vector corresponding to the true label y, plus the logarithm of the sum of the exponentiations of x transpose theta y prime for all of the labels y prime. Right, so that comes from the denominator. How did I obtain this expression? Well, we need to take the logarithm of a ratio that becomes the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. The log of the numerator is just x transpose theta y, but because I have to negate it to get the negative log likelihood, that's where the negative sign comes from. Okay. So let's draw a computation graph. We have x, which as you recall now is a vector. We have theta y1, which is a vector of weights for label 1, and we have theta y2, which is a vector of weights for label 2. Uh, let's say there's only two labels for now. So we would take the inner product or the dot product between x and theta y1, and we would take the inner product between x and theta y2, um, and then we would stack these two, right? So the inner product gives us a number, a scalar value, and we have one scalar value for the inner product for label y1, and another number for the inner product for label y2. So then we can stack them into a vector with two entries. Then we have our true label y. And the way we're going to represent our true label y is as what's called a one-hot vector. So y is not an integer, it's not like one or two, y is actually itself a vector, and it contains a zero everywhere except for the entry corresponding to the true label, which contains a one. So in this case, there's only two possible labels, so the vector has two entries, and if the true label is the first uh, label, then it's one, zero, and if the true label is a second label, then it's zero, one. If there were five possible labels, and the true label was a second one, what would the one-hot vector be? So five possible values, that means there's five dimensions, and the true label is the second one, that means it would be zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so that's a one-hot vector. Very important concept. We'll use this all the time for classification with neural networks. So now what we're going to do is we're going to actually take the inner product between this one-hot vector and the stacked uh, vector formed by uh, the inner product between x and theta y1 and x and theta y2. Why are we doing this? Well, because we essentially want a selector. We want to evaluate that first term in the negative log likelihood, the negative x transpose theta y, and that requires selecting the entry in that stacked vector corresponding to the true label. So if the true label is the second label, we should take the second entry, which corresponds to x transpose theta y2, and if the true label is the first one, then we should take the first entry corresponding to x transpose theta y1. So because the one-hot vector has ones and zeros everywhere, taking the inner product basically acts as a selection operation. So that gives us the first term in the negative log likelihood, right? That's what we produce at this node. Now we also need to calculate the second term, the log of the sum over all possible labels of the exponential of x transpose theta y prime. There are two possible uh, labels, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to exponentiate both of those inner products, add them up, and take the logarithm. Imagine for a second what the corresponding computation graph would look like. We already have the inner products, we've already calculated them. Um, so all we have to do is take each of those inner products and exponentiate them, and then sum them together. And then we need to take the logarithm. So now we've co computed both the first part and the second part. So the second part is sitting at that log node at the end, and the first part uh, is sitting at that um, multiplication node. So now we need the negative of x transpose theta y plus the log of the sum of the exponentials, so we have a, a subtraction node, right? So we take the log of the sum of exponentials and we subtract uh, x transpose theta y, which we've computed here. And that gives us our negative log likelihood loss. So this computation graph might look a little bit elaborate, but it's calculating the loss function for logistic regression. All right, now we can make this one a bit simpler also. And the way that we make it simpler is by 
using matrices. So before we made linear regression simpler by using vectors, now we're going to make logistic regression simpler by using matrices. If you recall from uh, lecture two, we can write logistic regression in matrix notation uh, as uh, some matrix theta times the vector x. Right. In lecture two, I actually had a uh, written the other way. I had x uh, transpose theta. Here I have a, I've just used the transpose, and this is going to be convenient later because when we talk about neural networks, we'll actually use this form. So theta here is a matrix that is formed by taking the weight vector for every label and stacking them up as rows. So the first row of the matrix theta is theta y1, the second row is theta y2, the third row is theta y3. So when we take this matrix and we multiply it by x, remember when you multiply a matrix by a vector, you take the vector, you rotate it 90 degrees, and you dot it with each of the rows, right? So uh, that gives us exactly this uh, vector containing x transpose theta y1, x transpose theta y2, through x uh, transpose theta ym, where m is the total number of labels, okay? So um, this is not yet the result of the softmax, then we take this vector and then we plug it into the softmax and that gives us our probability. Okay, so in matrix notation, it turns out that we can write the logistic regression computation graph much more easily. So we have x, which is a vector, and we have theta, which is now a matrix. Uh, what is the dimensionality of theta? How many rows does it have and how many columns? Well, so from looking at the picture, the number of rows is equal to the number of labels, and the number of columns is equal to the dimensionality of x. So we're going to do, perform matrix vector multiplication. So we'll multiply theta times x, and that'll give us this vector containing x transpose theta y1, x transpose theta y2, etc., etc. And then we will apply the softmax function to this vector. Right? What is the softmax function? Well, it's this function that we saw in lecture two. Uh, it's a function that takes in a vector and it outputs a vector. So it's a vector-valued uh, function with a vectorized input. And every entry uh, is computed by taking the exponential of the corresponding entry in the input vector and then dividing by the sum of the, exponent, of the exponentials of all the entries in the vector. So once we've computed the softmax, then we take our ground truth label y, represented like before as a one-hot vector, and we simply take the dot product between that and our softmax, right? So the output of the softmax is a vector where every entry uh, corresponds to the probability of a potential label. So by dotting it with a one-hot vector, with a one in the entry corresponding to the true label, this yields a scalar value, which is the probability of the ground truth label. And then we just take the logarithm of that. Uh, we also have to negate it, uh, and that gives us the negative log likelihood. So this is the computation graph for uh, logistic regression, written now with matrices and a little bit of a hack using this softmax circle to represent this you know, somewhat complex softmax function. So I've sort of brought in a little bit of abstraction, but it's a much more compact way to write it. And just glancing at this, we can kind of tell what's going on. Okay, so Take a moment to think about this computation graph, make sure that it's really clear to you what the graph means and how it represents logistic regression. Because from here on out, the models will get significantly more complicated. All right, so we could draw logistic regression even more concisely. Notice that we have two types of variables in these calculations. We have data variables like x and y, which are the input and the target output. And the data is going to be uh, different uh, for every data point, and the x kind of has to get propagated through this whole computation graph. Like it's all about somehow doing something to the x and then comparing it to y. So at this point, we're, we're saying things that are specific to machine learning. So you can write computation graphs for other kinds of programs that don't have data, but if you're doing machine learning, you typically have x's and y's. And they're kind of special because the y uh, always comes in at the end, in the loss function, and the x always comes in at the very beginning. And then you have other types of variables which are parameters. These are all these thetas, right? The parameters also have a particular pattern of how they're used. Uh, for example, the parameters usually affect one specific operation. Like theta y1 is just used in that one place where it multiplies x, and most likely nowhere else. 
Though oftentimes we will see some parameter sharing, for example, when we talk about convolutional neural networks uh, later, uh, but generally the functionality of these parameters is pretty localized. Like there's one place in the computation graph where that parameter is used, and that's basically it. So if we um, notice these properties, we can actually summarize this computation graph a little more concisely. This is not saying anything mathematical, this is just a different way of drawing it. So we know that theta is only going to affect what happens in one place. It basically affects that multiplication. So you can sort of think of theta as a parameter of that multiplication, right? So multiplication is just a mathematical operation, but you could say, well, there's an operation being done to x, and that operation is multiplied by theta. So you can sort of fold theta into that multiplication node. And you know that y is only going to affect what happens at the end, at the loss. So we could instead draw the same picture, but more concisely, by saying that x goes into a layer, an operation, uh, which we're going to call the linear layer. Why do we call it a linear layer? Well, because it's a matrix vector product, and that's a linear operation. So this linear layer has parameters. Those parameters are theta. Uh, and the, the theta is only going to affect that one circle. It's not going to come in anywhere else. So the linear layer just performs the, the multiplication of theta times x, matrix vector multiplication. This is also sometimes called a fully connected layer. Uh, the reason it's called a fully connected layer will be a little bit more obvious when we talk about convolutions later, but it's basically a matrix vector product. And then this goes into the softmax. And then the softmax goes into the loss function. And this is the cross entropy loss. If you remember from lecture two, the cross entropy loss is just a synonym for negative log likelihood. So the cross entropy loss is where the y comes in. The loss always depends on y, and also nothing that is not the loss ever depends on y, right? Because if your uh, model depended on y, then you'd be cheating. You'd be looking at the answer before you produce the answer. So only the loss can depend on y, and the loss has to depend on y. So we don't actually need to draw a y. We know that it's, it's going to come in for the loss. If we, if we write cross-entropy loss, we know that it has to depend on y, and we also know that anything before it cannot depend on y. Otherwise, you'd be cheating. Otherwise, you'd be looking at the answer before producing the answer. So we can equivalently draw logistic regression in this way, which now looks much, much simpler. It's just a chain of operations. Take x, multiply it by theta on the left, then apply the softmax, and then feed it into a cross-entropy loss, which basically will pull out the probability of the true label and take the logarithm of that and then negate it. So this is just another way to draw logistic regression that maybe is a little clearer because it removes some of the junk. Okay. So now we have this heavily simplified computation graph diagram. And we can con contrast this side by side to other common ways that people use to visualize neural networks. So a common way to draw a neural network diagram, very similar to this computation graph, is to visualize variables in the, ne in the network as boxes. So the first variable that everything starts with is the input x. And x is a vector. Uh, of length 2, so we say it's 2 by 1. So it has, it's, a, it's a column vector with two numbers, and it's only one column. Then we have a linear layer. You'll often see trapezoids used to represent layers. Um, that becomes a little bit uh, more obvious why, why we use that, that particular shape when we talk about convolutions, but you know this is a linear layer. So this is a matrix vector product. Technically, the linear layer depends on another variable, which is theta, but we often omit that from our pictures because usually the role of those parameters is local, so theta will influence just this layer. That is not always the case. We will sometimes have parameter sharing, in which case we have to somehow indicate this, but by default, uh, if you have a layer, that layer has parameters, and those parameters are not shared with anybody else unless stated otherwise. So often we don't draw the box labeled theta, because every layer has parameters. So if you draw a layer, that means you have parameters. So this linear layer transforms x into some intermediate representation. In our computation graph on the left, we didn't assign any label, and we didn't assign a name to those intermediate representations, but now we will. We'll call it z1. So z1 is the result of applying the first linear layer. So the superscript 1 denotes that it's the first layer. In logistic regression, it's the only layer. So it's the first and last but later we'll have more. And then we take this z1 and we feed it into the softmax, right? 
So the softmax is just a function. The softmax doesn't have any parameters. That's why I drew it in a different color. Um, and the softmax just takes this uh, two by one vector and it outputs another two by one vector containing probabilities. And then that gets fed into a cross entropy loss. And that takes in those probabilities and outputs a single scalar value representing the loss. Okay. And we often don't draw the loss because cross entropy pretty much always follows the softmax. So if you're calculating a softmax, it's, it usually means that you're going to put a cross entropy loss at the end of it. So oftentimes if we draw the neural network, we'll omit the cross entropy loss altogether. We can simplify this drawing even further, and this is the kind of picture that you'll see in a lot of research papers, for example, uh, where we would, of course, cut off the loss because we, we know that a cross entropy loss always follows the softmax, and we would also omit the, the green trapezoids and instead just um, label the arrows with the, with the layer. So that first arrow represents a linear layer, and you know that if it's a linear layer, it has parameters. So the parameters are not drawn and the green trapezoid is not drawn. You just have an arrow representing uh, a, a, a layer, a linear operation. So in some ways, this graph we have in the lower right is almost dual to the graph on the left because the graph on the left shows just the mathematical operations, whereas the graph on the lower right uh, mostly shows the intermediate variables. But this is the kind of graph that you'll see very often in research papers. Okay, so again, nothing here is changing mathematically. This is just the same logistic regression that we had before. All we're doing is discussing different ways to draw it uh, as a picture. Okay, so now let's talk about going beyond logistic regression. So logistic regression is great if your data is uh, linearly separable or close to it. So if you have a classification problem like the one shown here, separate the orange from the blue, then a linear model like logistic regression will work great. So if you just do softmax of x transpose theta, you'll probably find a really good classifier. But what if your data looks like this? Here you have this kind of checkerboard pattern where the orange stuff in the top left and the bottom right, and the blue stuff is in the bottom left and the top right. Now, you can't really draw a single line to cleanly separate all the orange from the blue. Right? The line shown here is actually a really bad classifier. However, you could draw the line if you use features. So instead of drawing the line in the two-dimensional space uh, represented by x1 and x2, you would instead augment that space with additional features like maybe x1 squared and x2 squared and x1 times x2. And then you would do logistic regression in that feature space. So instead of doing softmax x transpose theta, you would now do softmax of phi of x transpose theta, where phi of x is a vector, a bigger vector, uh, maybe it contains x1 and x2, but it also contains x1 squared and x2 squared and x1 times x2, and maybe some other functions of uh, x1 and x2. So if you pick a good feature vector, then logistic regression can actually separate classes that are not otherwise linearly separable in the original input space. By the way, in this case, what is the dimensionality of theta? So before, theta would have been 2 by 2, or maybe if you had a bias term, it would have been 2 by 3. Here with this feature vector, what would the dimensionality of theta be? Well, we have five features and we have two classes, so theta uh, would be uh, 2 by 5, or if you had a bias term, it would be 2 by 6. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we could learn the features instead of having to specify them manually. So here's the problem. How do we represent the learned features? You know, we could make up some mathematical operations like x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, um, and somehow select among them, but we would like some representation for features that we could learn with gradient descent. So how could we represent our features? Well, here's an idea. What if each feature is itself the output of a binary logistic regression model, right? So we're going to be doing logistic regression at the end. Let's actually do logistic regression for every feature to compute that feature. Uh, and we'll do binary logistic regression. So each of our features will be a number between zero and one. Remember, at the end of lecture two, we talked about how in the special case when things are binary, you, can, you only need one 
uh, weight vector instead of two because uh, it's equivalent, right? So we, we saw the sigmoid function, one over one plus the exponential of negative x transpose theta um, that we uh, used to get the softmax for the, for the binary case. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to do binary logistic regression to get our feature. So here's the first feature, phi, phi 1. We're going to have many features, but this is the first one, phi 1 of, phi 1 of x. And it's just given by the binary softmax applied to x transpose w11. Uh, why am I calling it w11 instead of theta? Well, because now we're going to have some parameters in the features and some more parameters in the classifier at the top. So I want to use a different symbol. I'm going to switch to using lowercase w or uppercase w instead of theta, which is also more conventional for neural networks. And that'll make it a little easier for us to distinguish which parameters go where. So if the thetas are just going to disappear. We're going to have w's everywhere. Uh, and if I ever use theta, I use theta to refer to all the parameters in the model. But those parameters will be distributed among many, many different weight vectors and weight matrices. So I'll usually use w. But if you see theta, that means all the parameters. OK, so w with a lower case, with a superscript 1 and a subscript 1 represents the weights, aka the parameters, of feature 1 at layer 1. Uh, and then I'm going to apply this sigmoid to it, which is uh, going to put x transpose w11 into the range 0 to 1. So the superscript denotes which layer. So this is the first layer, the first layer of features. And the subscript denotes which feature. And which feature it is basically means which row of the weight matrix. So just like we could write a matrix for logistic regression, we can write a matrix for this feature. And every row in that matrix is going to be the weight vector for a different feature. OK, so we could have many features like this, not just one. So phi 1 is obtained by uh, uh, applying this binary softmax, so this is also called the sigmoid, or the logistic function, to x transpose w11. The second entry is obtained by applying that function to x transpose w21, and the third one, x transpose w31. And a convenient shorthand is to write it as a function sigma applied to the matrix w1 times x. Right? Because when you take the matrix w1 and you multiply it by x, then you get a, a column vector where every entry uh, corresponds to one of those feature uh, vectors multiplied by x. So the first entry is x transpose w11, the second one is x transpose w21, and so on and so on. And then the function sigma is a per element function that takes every element in its input vector and applies this binary um, softmax to it. So it's, it's a per element sigma. It takes every element, and for that element, does 1 over 1 plus exponential of negative whatever the value in the vector is. This is not the same as a softmax, because a softmax, when applied to a big vector, will normalize by the sum of the exponentials in that vector. This is a per element operation. So each feature here is independent. Each feature is independently given this binary softmax, which is also called the sigmoid or the logistic function. So it's very similar to a softmax, but it's per dimension. Every dimension gets hit by this 1 over 1 plus exponential negative, whatever the entry there was. Okay, so this is kind of a lot to take in. So let's just briefly recap. We are learning our features. Our features are produced by a model that looks very much like logistic regression. But we have many features. So each individual feature is the result of applying a binary logistic regression model, which corresponds to multiplying, taking the inner product of x with some weight uh, vector, and then applying the sigmoid function, which is to say you take that inner product and you do 1 over 1 plus the exponential negative inner product. But you have many of these features. So a convenient way to write it in a matrix notation is to say we'll take some matrix capital W multiplied by x, and that'll give us a vector where every entry in that vector uh, corresponds to one of these x transpose w things. So the first entry is x transpose w1, one, the next one is x transpose w2, one, and so on and so on. And then we apply this function sigma, which is just a per element softmax. So it takes the first element and applies a binary softmax, a logistic function to it. It takes a second element, 
and applies this logistic function to it, to it. It takes the third element, and so on and so on, which is not the same as a softmax we learned about before. Okay, so uh, let's draw a diagram of this thing. So now we're going to learn our features, and our features are going to be given by sigma w1x, and then on top of those features, we'll use our previous uh, softmax model. So if we want to draw it using the same convention that we had before for these simplified computation graphs, we'll say we, we have x coming in, it's a 2 by 1 vector, and then there's a linear layer. So x is multiplied on the left by w. If we have three features, w is 3 by 2, and this is w1. This is the weight corresponding to the first linear layer. Then we have our sigmoid function. The sigmoid function does not have any parameters. So it takes in a 3 by 1 vector, and it produces a 3 by 1 vector. And we'll sometimes use a1 uh, to denote this uh, vector. Then we have another linear layer. And we'll call the parameters of the second linear layer w2. And then we have a, a, the same kind of softmax that we had before, this logistic regression part. And then we have our cross-entropy loss. So what we've added here compared to the previous logistic regression model is the, the additional linear layer and sigmoid. And by putting those in, now we're allowing the model to learn features. We could also draw this using the, the convention for uh, drawing neural networks, where we say that we have first a linear layer to go from x to some intermediate representation, which I'll call z1. Then we have a sigmoid which takes us z1 into a1. Then we have another linear layer, which produces z2, then a softmax, and then a cross-entropy loss. All right, so we have a model that extends logistic regression to allow us to learn features. This is a basic neural network model. The features are given by something very much like logistic regression where we take a linear operation on the input and then apply a nonlinearity, in this case, a sigmoid. And then those features are used for the next layer, which is a standard logistic regression layer, which actually produces probabilities for the different classes. We can draw it in a simpler way. Uh, so a simpler way to draw the same thing could be to omit the box that says sigmoid and just label the layers as being sigmoid layers rather than linear layers. So if someone says, I have a sigmoidal layer, uh, or I have a logistic layer. What they mean is a linear operation followed by a sigmoid. And of course, just like we, we saw before, we could omit those green trapezoids and just label the arrows by the kind of layer that sits there. And if you, if you see something like this, then you know what's going on. And sometimes people will refer to this as sigmoid layer, fully connected layer. If they have some other kind of operation instead of a sigmoid, it would be labeled with, the, with its name. Now, of course, you don't have to have one layer of feature ex extraction. The whole point of deep learning is to use many layers. So you could, for example, have a linear layer followed by a sigmoid, and then another linear layer followed by another sigmoid, and then another linear layer followed by another sigmoid, and then another linear layer, and then a softmax, and then things go off the end of the page because they're so big. Um, and that's where the more compact way of drawing neural networks comes in real handy, because now we could draw this uh, neural network with many layers, much more compactly, just by labeling the arrows as sigmoid layers. So now we have three sigmoid layers instead of uh, just one, and then we have the same logistic regression at the top. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about this thing called activation functions. So I mentioned before that our each of our features is produced by taking a linear operation uh, of, the, of the input and then applying this what I call the binary uh, softmax, which is the sigmoid function. But you don't have to use that function. You could use any other function you want. You don't have to use a sigmoid. And, that, and actually, a wide range of nonlinear functions will work. So you just replace this softmax with something else. We'll discuss specific choices for this function later. It's, it's called an activation function. Uh, and there are many choices that will work, but it has to be nonlinear meaning it has to be something other than a matrix multiplication. Why does it have to be nonlinear? Well, let's imagine uh, that 
it was some linear function, specifically the identity function. So the activation of the second layer is obtained by sigma of w2 times sigma of w1 times x, right? So I've just written out the equation for the second layer activations in a neural network. And let's say that sigma was the identity. If sigma was some linear function that was not identity, you could just fold that into w, so you might as well make it identity. So this is, this is a linear function, right? This is what we don't want. What happens if sigma is linear? Well, uh, then a2 is just going to be w2 times w1 times x, which is equal to m of x for some other matrix m. See, the thing is, when you compose two linear operations, in this case w2 and w1, the result of that composition is always itself linear, which means that it can be represented with another matrix. So having two linear layers in sequence is useless because it's the same as having one linear layer. But if you put nonlinearities between them, then it's actually useful to have two layers. So that's why activation functions have to be nonlinear. If they're linear, then all those layers basically collapse, and it's no different than just having one layer. So multiple linear layers is the same as one linear layer. But if you put nonlinearities between them, then they're actually co computing some more complex function. Now, you do have a lot of freedom about what nonlinear operation you choose. You can kind of think of a neural net almost like a, like a pile of, uh, of mathematical operations, almost like a, a mathematical lasagna, where you alternate between layers of uh, matrix multiplication and nonlinearity. So matrix, nonlinearity, matrix, nonlinearity. It's like a linear algebra lasagna. Enough layers, and you can re represent anything so long as your layers are nonlinear. It reminds me a little bit of this comic, right? This is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. A neural network is just a big pile of linear algebra interspersed with nonlinearities. But maybe the lasagna is a better uh, metaphor because you have to really alternate them for them to make sense. And what if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the pile until they start looking right. And in the next section of the lecture, we'll talk about how to stir the pile. But before th that, let's do a little demo. Let's see uh, logistic regression and neural networks in action. So this is a this demo was made using a really nice tool uh, called playground.tensorflow.org that you can check out and play with yourself. So what we'll do in this video is we'll, we'll first run logistic regression on a linearly separable example. And you can see when it's linearly separable, logistic regression is perfect. Now I switch to an example that is not linearly separable, and I run logistic regression. You can see that the loss is decreasing, but it gets about 50% error because it can't linearly separate them. Next, I'm going to add a feature. I'm going to add this x1 times x2 feature. It's a really good feature for this task, so logistic regression just nails it. But of course, I have to know which feature to pick. So if I don't want to uh, manually design this feature, I'll add another hidden layer. I'll add that additional uh, linear layer followed by a sigmoid. And then when I train my neural network, um, it gets kind of something kind of all right. Let me increase the number of features, the number of neurons. And now it gets an even more interesting decision boundary. It takes quite a bit longer to train, as you can see, but as that decision boundary shifts, eventually gets into position and figures out the right classifier. Okay, the last little bit for this part of the lecture is a little aside. And the aside is to explain why we call them neural networks. And I, I mentioned this a little bit in the first lecture of the class, but I want to revisit this a little bit. What's so neural about these neural networks? Well, a simple model of a neuron might look a little bit like this. You have some uh, dendrites in the neuron, and the dendrites receive signals from other neurons, from other upstream neurons. And then the neuron is going to decide whether to emit an electrical signal or not, whether to fire or not, based on the incoming signals. Now, real neurons are pretty complicated, but a crude computational model of a neuron might say that the neuron will decide to fire based on how much signal it's getting from everybody else. So maybe the neuron will somehow add up all those signals, and if they're big enough, then it will fire, and if not, then it won't fire. And then if it does decide to fire, then the axon transmits the signal to downstream neurons. Now, this is a pretty idealized model of how neurons work, because there's also neurotransmitters. Um, the synapses between neurons are really complicated, so it's not, it's not really that simple. But to a very crude order of approximation, this maybe is how we could crudely think of a neuron. So now let's think about what the features in our neural network do. Each of our artificial neurons sums up the signals from upstream units, and the very first layer just takes the input. So summing them up means uh, that you 
just take everything coming in and you, you add it together. In a neural network, you add it together weighted by the corresponding weights. So if the weights were all 1, then W transpose X would just sum up the entries in X. But the weights are not 1, um, and that corresponds to the strength of the synapses. But it's some kind of sum. It's basically a weighted sum. And if that sum is big enough, then this unit will emit a big number. So then this computational neuron decides how much to fire based on the incoming signals, and that decision is the nonlinearity. So the, so the function sigma takes very low values and maps them to numbers close to zero, takes very big values and maps them to numbers close to one, and the numbers in between land somewhere in between. You can almost think of it like a soft threshold. So that's why we call this an activation function. It's a function that determines how much you activate based on the sum of incoming activations you received. So then the activations are transmitted to the downstream units. So those features, the thing that I called phi1 before, is basically a computational model of a neuron.